available now at whitepillbook.com. This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us a guest who has been a long time coming, Colin Moriarty. Colin, we've been trying to do this for a few years now, I think. You run Last Stand Media. You host Sacred Symbols, which is a PlayStation podcast. Yes. I got to tell you, I was a Nintendo kid. And I'm old enough and annoyed and annoying enough that I was also like a DC Comics kid. So like if anyone likes Marvel, it's a complete non-starter. Sure. So for me, play and like Debbie Gibson and Tiffany. Uh, <laughs> so for me, and I'm obviously team Debbie Gibson because she wrote her own songs. Uh, I, 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 There has to be some little animus between me and you on that front. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I, I grew up a Nintendo kid too before PlayStation even existed. I Nintendo didn't lose me totally until the Wii. And then I was I was out. But I love so, Nintendo. The NES is my favorite console of all time. So you're, yeah, you're, it, yeah, and I've it, there, if you're bored, I, I recommend to people those stupid games you watch as a kid that you couldn't get through. Sit and watch a walkthrough on YouTube. It's a lot of fun, particularly Athena, a game which made absolutely no <laughs> it made no sense at the time. I hate that game. That's a game that game's notorious with my brother and I. SNK, yeah, off one of the worst games ever. And, yeah, um, but you, yeah. I, could, it, it, you have no idea what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. but. There's people who have figured it out who have more autism than me. So if you go to YouTube and watch the playthrough, it's like, oh, this is how the game actually ends. Now, Colin, one of the things I want to talk to you about, and I have this whole long speech ready, because when you work in social media, you know what the responses are going to be, what the actually guy is going to say, and you're anticipatory. So let me give my speech, then I'll ask you your question, okay? You are one of the few people, or one of several people, excuse me, who was canceled. Life's over, it's a wrap, career's done, and now you're thriving. And that's a story people don't get to hear because there's all this talk about cancel culture. And in my opinion, cancel culture is not as bad as it has been a few years ago. And, I, and this is where the screaming starts. And let me get ahead of it. All I'm saying is, I'm not saying cancel culture is gone. I'm not saying cancel culture is good. I'm not saying it's not a big deal to get canceled. All I'm saying is it's better to have AIDS in 2023 than in 1987. Things have improved. It doesn't mean they're acceptable. I'm just saying, and one big example of this is Elon Musk taking over Twitter because it used to be you got, what, four websites. If you're knocked off all four platforms, if you knocked off the, all those four, you're done. And now even if there's one, it's not great. It's not good. This is not where we want to be. That's what I'm saying, Kathy Newman. I'm just saying this is progress in the right direction. Now, you had a tweet that in retrospect, and this also speaks to my point, it's almost shocking that this is something that would get anyone in trouble. Can can you yeah. tell that, that whole story? Sure. Yeah, it's very anodyne when you go back and look at yeah, it. Yeah, right? Even like, I, I, I was looking at it, and I'm just yeah, like, I'm like I don't is... even understand what happened, really. Yes. But, um, but in, the, in the storm, it was different. So um, I was senior editor a long time ago of IGN, which is a huge video game website. And I was there for a long time, since 2002 to 2014. Um, and um, in 2014, I left to co-found a company called Kind of Funny, which still exists today. And I did that until early 2017. In March of 2017, I tweeted during the hashtag day without a woman, or day without, yeah, day without a woman or women. I don't even remember what it is anymore. And I tweeted out, uh, um, ah, peace and quiet. And then just the hashtag. And just something really added. And I actually remember it's it's funny because I remember so clearly sending the tweet because I was um sitting with my ex-girlfriend at the time and uh it was like this is funny, right? And she's like, Yeah, it's funny. And then I literally went into an Uber and went to work. So it was like it, I didn't even think I This is the of kind of tweet someone writes when they're on the toilet, right? It's completely like a brain fart, it's a silly joke, it's irreverent. You're just you're real back, uh you're bandwagoning on what the trending tweet of the day is. It's neither here nor there. And it's the kind of joke that you would see on like any dopey sitcom. It, it, it's it's just so innocuous that anyone would take umbrage at this. It, it's it's if anything, it's it, the, the the offensiveness is the laziness of it. It's like oh, ha, women don't shut up. This totally. is like 1950s humor. Yeah, it's it's horrible. I mean, I I've referred to it as you know yeah Archie Bunker in the 70s yeah. or you know something like from Married with Children or something totally. Of um, you, you know calling Peg that or something like that. So. Yeah. 
I got into the car and I was just going to work and then it really all blew up that day. But there is context, which is I was an open Republican and open conservative yeah. in the games industry. So um, I feel like with many cancellations, at least in my opinion, there's always something and then they'll try to figure out right. something to destroy you with. And I think that 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 was just the nexus of those two things. Yeah, they they find the target. And then, and by the way, this is one of the big reasons I'm an anarchist, right? Like, they, uh, Al Capone is obviously not a good guy. Al Capone should have been in jail. They didn't put him in jail for tax evasion. They just got him for tax evasion because, like, this is what we could get him for. Right. And this works the same exact way. This guy's a target. He's got to be destroyed. Oh, good. We got it. Like, ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Now we got this dopey tweet that if anyone else who wasn't, a, and by the way, the other context is this is right after the Trump inauguration. And there was right. that whole the whole narrative that now that Trump is president, like people will be able to date rape at will and it'll be, if anything, <laughs> mandatory. Right? I mean, th but that was the whole idea that totally. like, you have this grab them by the you know what in the White House. And now like women are going to have to, you know, be giving hand jobs at, at Red Lobster. And that's the highest job they can get. <laughs> yeah, they had this handmaid's tale type right. um, thing going on in their minds. And yeah, I, I said many times being in the games industry for so long, knowing so many of those people, Trump in that era just broke the industry and broke a lot of people's brains totally, completely and utterly. And so, yeah, because there, in, in the in the prelude to that, I did say things like the, when he was elected, I think I tweeted something like the world's not over. And yeah. that alone was like. Um, and, and what, are you, what are you saying? Are you saying it's a good thing that blah, 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 blah? Yeah. Right, exactly. It's like you always tweet the the, the Kathy Newman, right, the the uh, <laughs> the picture because, and I love that with when trying to tell Jordan Peterson what he's saying. It's like, no, that's why I just stopped tweeting entirely, except for like ads for shows I do. Because I'm like, I can't even deal with this anymore. It's just you. I love following you because you're like the, you're like the, the, the sh I love watching the schadenfreude and all of that. And you're it's the so conduit good. by which I'm able to, to enjoy it. So I appreciate that but I don't, I don't like doing it. Many such cases. Like yeah. you, you'd be surprised how many people who have real lives, unlike myself, and you just got engaged last summer. Congratulations to you. Thank you. So, so people who have, which is going to be funny because even when you're married as a gamer, you're still an incel. I think that's just how the rules work. Yeah, totally. But totally. There, there are so many people out there who are in my DMs, like fairly big names who are like, just keep going because it's just so fun watching you be a jackass on Twitter. Yeah, you're wonderful. I think you're one of the funniest, funniest and most interesting people on the platform, actually. So yeah, keep it up. So you're in the Uber, you go in the office mm -hmm. and just tell that whole story of like Sure, how, so I yeah. got, we were supposed to go to PAX that weekend, which is a, like a couple times a year, they have PAX, which is Penny Arcade Expo. It's kind of a big con con convention in Boston and Seattle and other places. So we had a panel actually at one of them um, for my old company and we were going to go to that. But all this broke down and it's so funny because there is so much background. Like I wanted to do more political content. I wanted to even, we had a very popular Patreon at the time, but I wanted to spin off and do something else on my own. They really wanted to own everything I did. I had a lot of animosity with one of the other co-founders in particular. So all of that added up to kind of being like, maybe it's just time that we go our separate ways. Um, but the disappointing thing about that is, you know, no one really had my back or backup. It was like just burning me as I left and just kind of pushing me out. I made a lot of money when I left, but um, because I sold my part of the company, but um, yeah, it was it was a, a horrible thing where a lot of people that very tweet and my by the way my refusal to apologize for it, which was a major part of it. I was just like, I'm not I don't apologize for things that what that I don't yeah exactly like people that listen to my shows. We we begin every one of our shows with what we got wrong in the last episode. I like keeping things very honest. It's like okay, we got this fact wrong. Someone wrote in about this, telling us we got this wrong. So I'll apologize and make things right, but not for jokes, not for stupid things like that. And I was just like, no, I'm not. I'm simply you could tell, as you brought up during that opening Trump era, that things were the rules were just going to be different. And it requires people to kind of just stand up, even people who are not Trump voters. I, by the way, I, I didn't vote for Trump. I voted for Gary Johnson, you know, but it, it's it's just the proximity. I did, as I say often, Michael, I was the closest thing to a Trump voter any of those yes. people had ever seen. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and it's it, yeah. it's also kind of funny because the tweet was, uh, you know, peace and quiet day without women. And they wouldn't shut the hef, shut the F up about it <laughs> until you exactly. apologize. So I, exactly. I, I, they sure proved you wrong. I know that. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it, it was I just the other thing is that I've said so many more offensive things than that. That's why I was so curious about like we we would be really offensive on our shows. I mean, not like horrible, but things that I think people would be much more offended by. It was just the context and the kind of looking for something to get me with, especially because I was just unapologetically conservative during a time when the industry thought the world was ending.
So but, that was it. So I, the closest analog I have to that is when my mentor, Harvey Picard, died on my birthday in July 12th, 2010. And it was really kind of upsetting to me. Obviously, Harvey dying. Obviously, on my birthday, these are two things. But it was interesting which of the people who I had around me made me feel better and which people around me made me feel worse. Um, and this was, you know, it, it was kind of like and there's some people i kind of lost relationships with at that moment including members of my family because like if i'm like suffering this is like kind of, like this was i would say probably the worst day of my life at that point and you're here just twisting the knife for whatever reason like what the hell what the hell good are you right so was that a moment for you when all this falling out fallout is happening did you have that sense of feeling overwhelmed and was there this kind of like oh i see you I, I thought we were cool i mean were you surprised by who who shook out and which side yeah, I was surprised by how many people didn't shake out on my side. Okay. Um, that was, I think, in in some sense, because it's so it's so liberal and there's nothing else in that industry. It's very much like other entertainment spheres. It's not like politics where there is a massive conservative side, a massive liberal side. And I don't necessarily think any of that matters. But since it does in that industry, I think that a lot of people were just afraid. I mean, to this day, Michael, I mean, it, it happened, what, six years ago almost? To this day, I have people saying like... Uh, Oh, don't don't tell anyone I told you that or don't I, I don't I can't be on the show because I don't want people to to think that's out of the other thing. And and a lot of people behind the scenes, to their credit, um, just let me go entirely. Uh, so it wasn't like they were being fake behind the scenes or anything like that. It was just surprising and very hurtful because I had re real relationships. I would even consider um, like mentor like I mentored some of these people. And certainly I got even a few of them jobs at IGN and got them in the industry. And so I felt I felt totally betrayed at that time. I mean, it was 2017, as I say, 2017, 2018 was the darkest period of my life because my entire social reality changed. And I had to um, I had to reframe everything around around different people and the people that didn't throw me away. And most importantly, the people that didn't say anything when it would have mattered the most as far as like, wait a minute, that because as it always happens with cancellation, me saying that made me misogynist, a yes. bigot. And then I was racist. There was actually a business insider post right, yes. that said that I was racist and everyone's like, uh, even they had a recant um, that. So it got out of control and no one at that time stood up and say like, there, I worked at IGN with this guy for 10 years. This guy did this for me. I, 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 this, I slept on his couch for a month when I was getting my feet under me. He did this for me. He did that for me. None of that. And I'm a pretty loyal person. I always say I dance with the ones that brought me always. And I, I, uh, that was just unbelievable and showed the true feelings that I guess a lot of people had for me, but also the, the self-protection that a lot of people have. And as the games media dies, in turn, I can't help but be like, bye. So, you know, it's like... <laughs> in 1973, the New York City Police Department created a hostage negotiation team. It's not up against the gun. It's up against the man's mind. When you're defusing a human bomb, it's the same as when you're taking apart a real bomb. If you skip a step, that's going to blow up right in your face. Talk To Me tells the high-stakes true story of the world's first hostage negotiation team. It changed policing forever. Talk To Me. So one of the things that was reassuring is you could pay your rent, right? Oh, yeah. Because for a lot of people who get canceled, then it's like, holy crap, am I going to be homeless, right? Because overnight it feels like everything's being taken from you. Was it very clear to you as this was imploding and how quickly was it happening that you were going to still be able to have a roof over your head? Or was that in question? No, that wasn't in question. To be perfectly honest, like I am a chronic saver. And okay. I had a lot of money put away. Good. And I I don't think I've ever said this, but it was paid over time. But I mean, I got a half a million dollars when I, oh, when wow. I was kind okay, of funny. Um, it was paid out over three years. Um, sure. But I got that and I had plenty of money put away. And I was coming off of a, a six figure salary anyway. So it was. I was OK. And I think that that's a really important thing to say, because I do know that most people, if not a majority, vast majority are not anywhere in that position. And it's much scarier. I had two advantages is one is that I just live well below my means. I always have. I still do. And number two is uh, I was a well-known person, so I knew I could take people with me. Um, and so there was no financial worry, at least in the immediacy. I probably could have lived for a long, you know, quite a while, probably till now, if I really just lived frugally without doing anything. But I knew. I'm a workaholic. I like creating and I like doing things and I wanted to get back out there. And that money allowed me to kind of solidify things, make investments, buy equipment, um, feed and house myself, like you said, and, and all of that. But there was never any real 
worry because of yeah the financial reality that I was coming into or out of. And I also have a very large family, and I think that you know someone would have been like, you can come stay with me at, at some point if, if so, worst came to worst. So let's talk about this because one of the things during moments of crisis is that everything feels overwhelming. And the way I compare it to people, it's like you're trying to squat and deadlift at the same time. It's you, your brain can only handle so many fronts at once. I think women are probably better handling that because they're better multitasking than men. But can you, while this is going on, like people who you thought were your bros are just shrugging their shoulders, not returning your calls or just being all of a sudden corporate with you. And I'm sure these terse emails instead of these long things joking around. And now you're like, okay, is legal going to have to get involved? What's it like seeing the R word, the R word, like racist? It's hard to attach to your name because it's Horrible. like I, you didn't, there, no, there's no race implied or mentioned in that tweet. No. And so to, to qualify that, I once like years later, a couple of years later, I said something along the lines of I think the Asian American experience in the United States proves that white supremacy is not okay. a real thing. And I believe that, by the way, that's totally true. That's what everyone always points to when they say I'm racist. So that that's now the qualifier. That particular tweet, just like when I'm sexist, it's this particular yeah. thing that happened to me. Um, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's kind of crazy because I just, that hurts. And for yeah. no one to stand up, like my fiance is black and, um, she even has had experiences. Does she know people. you're racist? Yeah. She, she doesn't know I'm <laughs> racist yet. Um, but she's even had experiences online where people are being like, how can you be with this person who, who is a racist or whatever? And she's like, you're telling me yeah. who I, I'm black and I know him. You've and you are the judge. That's why I had to get away from all the parasocial insanity, yeah. right? And just be like, I can't, um, I can't, <laughs> I just can't do this anymore. So it, it showed a lot of people for being just, I don't know. I just expected it kind of, you kind of can't help, but I, this is what I'm sorry. I'm like mumbling right now. When I saw a therapist after it all happened. Okay, good. One of the things I said was it, you kind of can't help, but take it really personally that, no one gives a shit like no one out there who knew you worked with you even lived with you shared a cubicle with you traveled with you is being like whoa whoa, whoa. racist like what what did so that kind of that silence allows things to become quote unquote real and i think that's one of the things that bothers me most most about talking about cancellation is everyone's always like oh it doesn't matter it's this isn't really happening and i'm like what? it matters to the person who it happened to of course and it and the precedent that it sets so unfortunately, people not stepping up and maybe saying, you know, protecting me in quotes, maybe had detrimental effects down the line on the next person because no one showed that necessary bravery. That's why I, it was important for me to stand up immediately and be like, I'm not apologizing. I'm doing something else. I'm still here. I'm still going to work. I'm still going to work hard. I'm going to do the best I can. And, you know, that's it. But um, I didn't want it to I didn't want it to go like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's also that sense of like. I'm sh and I want to hear you talk about this, and I'm glad you went to therapy. Um, that Thank sense you. of spiraling powerlessness, right? Because something just got unleashed. It, I mean, it's like a video game, right? You got this demon that got unleashed. You have no idea how big and powerful it's going to get, right? You, you, you have only so many whatever swords and bombs in your repertoire to fight this dugong, dugong, whatever it's called, the dongo. Uh, the, the, yeah. <laughs> The, the Zelda, the Zelda, uh, yeah, Triceratops, right? Um, the Dongo, yeah, yeah, and it's just like you know what? Where does this end? Because you've, I'm sure, because we all, and this happens to happen to me too, and I think this is useful for people to know when they're experiencing crisis. The human mind tends to catastrophize, right? So immediately you start going to the worst possible scenario, and I think it's very hard in that moment for someone experiencing this to realize that a lot of people, like a lot don't care like you, it, it, even though it feels like you're, you're the center of the universe at that moment because all of a sudden you're hearing from all these different resources it's not really as overwhelming to other people as it feels to you totally and it's <laughs> that's hard to kind of convey to other people it seems you know i think to a lot of people still and i, I bet you can relate to this a lot of the, the dummies that tweet at you probably feel this way is um it's not real. Like none of this is real. It's all a stage where plays go on and nothing really matters. And everyone's a grifter and everyone's making tons of money and saying whatever they need to say and all these things. But in reality, yeah, like I, I had to go get help because it was, um, I wasn't able to sleep. I wasn't able to really, I like, I, I'm so stressed out all the time that the, I knew that I had to work. I knew that I had to get work done. That was never a problem because I knew I'd be even more stressed if I didn't do that. 
But all the social pressures and kind of wondering, do you still have connections? What bridges are burned? Not really knowing when you text someone for the first time or call someone or talk to someone for the first time, are they going to respond to you? How do they feel about you? Do they know? When I moved into my, I live in in the middle of Virginia now in this new neighborhood and I, I, I have a house here and I'm like, I'm friendly with my neighbors, but I wonder, did anyone know who I am? Do they look this up and then they think these things about me? And um, it stays with you and it yeah. will never go away. So it's it's something that you always have to be kind of cognizant of. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. And, and I'm sure, you know, gaming is a hobby or a, a subculture that, you know, is so interesting. That's there's so much history there. There's so much. I mean, I have um, my favorite game is. Um, I'm completely blanking on the name. It's the one with the girl singing and she's running around. It's it, it's that great design game. Um, it's, the girl uh, singing. She she creates statues by singing. It's it's this just whole like walking around. It, it was a uh, Greece or a Gris. How it's pronounced? G R I S. Oh, Gris. Yeah, I haven't played that. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm not. Playing I have that. some original art by the Colin Duc Colin whatever his name is, the artist who designed it, like hanging up in my living room. There's just so much excitement in the gaming sphere. And now you have to, in your world, that is your reality and your identity, you have to feel like you're radioactive. And you have to wonder if whoever you meet and just you just want to, hey, I just want to talk about Mario. Are they going to be perceiving you as having a clan hood? Right, exactly. And are, like, it's, it's so funny, too, because then there are expectations in the audience. Like, are you going to cover this? Are you going to cover it this way? Are you going to have these people on that we don't like? There's so much baggage with it. And that's why I felt immediately when I founded Last Stand, it's like, well, I can't do games, at least right away. Like, I don't think I'm welcome here. I don't think I'm wanted here. Yeah. And so I did a lot of political commentary for about six months. And people were by the thousands basically being like, can you please come back? Like, please yeah. do something in games. I, I felt very scorned um, in PlayStation. There's a thing called trophies, which you get when you play a game and you earn a bunch of things like you beat the stage. You did all these things. OK. And if you and if you look at my 2017, you know, it tracks over many years, like what you've done. And if you look at 2017 from when I quit kind of funny and left until the fall of that year, I basically didn't play anything because it was like painful. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and I would try and try to get into it and all these things. And so I, I felt like it was uh, it, a lot of people bring in a lot, of, especially a lot of my detractors are like, you tried to leave games and you didn't want to do this anymore. And I'm like, dude, you wouldn't either. Um, it took yeah. time for me to kind of wrap myself around this idea of coming back and doing my own thing. And when I came back and did my own thing, I didn't anticipate, frankly, that I was going to build something as big as it became and that a lot of people were going to glom onto it because of this need for honesty and candor that they weren't getting. It, it, it backfired on a lot of people. And um, I'm grateful for that. It's like you said earlier, if I could have just told myself then what would have happened, then I would have been in much better shape. I wouldn't have friggin you know felt like i was dying basically for the entire year yeah my friend my friend jackie she just gave me this like little parable from a rabbi and i think it's like one of the most profound things anyone ever told me which is imagine you got in a time machine and you went back 10 years and you you met yourself and you all those things you were freaking and everyone listening to this just think about 10 years ago all the things you're freaking out about the relationship your job you know what am i gonna do and you were just in it like worried about this and that and how few of those things came true and how the ones that you were right to worry about still, even if they didn't work out, you still are here and you got through it. If you could just tell yourself that, you know what I mean? Like it would be so much easier, but you could do that right now. You can imagine 2033, you know, Colin or Michael going back in time and being like, hey, like, A, you're probably, you're dead in five years, but in those five years, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to really be, be a, a great time. One of the things I, I really want to talk to you and and I know this, you're going to probably have like a half hour speech and do not hold back the monologue. Um, one of the things I had a chapter on my book, The New Right, is Gamergate, right? And I think a lot of what progressives want to frame reality as is progressives versus like white supremacists. And conservatives want to be like it's progressives versus conservatives. But they're forgetting there's a huge group of people who just want to not talk about politics at all. Mm -hmm. Like imagine you lived in reality where everyone had to talk about football, like no matter what. And it's just like, I don't care about football, right? <laughs> so, but Gamergate, as I understood it, and you're going to have a better view than I was, we just wanted to play video games. And the point is, you, there was nowhere, to, you go to, people go to video games to escape reality. You're going to another planet, you're going to the Middle Ages, you're Dungeon Dragons, whatever it is. Like, I want to leave the earth and have this kind of fantasy adventure. 
And even the places people go to escape the earth, you can't escape the edicts of progressivism. If it's a game in the Middle Ages, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm thinking of. I don't know. The Kingdom name. Come Deliverance. Yes. Right. There aren't enough African Americans. Yeah. In that uh, term specifically. Century Bohemia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in, in yeah, in like the Middle Ages, in what is now the Czech Republic. <laughs> but I mean, I and one the example I use in my book is I think his name is Tuvok. There was a black Vulcan, and they're like, oh, finally there's a black Vulcan. And I I, I think so, someone correct me, but like the idea that the races would evolve independently, identically on another planet is also just violates basic biology. But no, it doesn't matter if you are not for this, you're a uh, racist. So can you give me your perspective on Gamergate? Because I'm sure you were covering it very heavily as it was unfolding. Yeah, so I was senior editor at IGN when it happened. And I remember very vividly having a meeting about it with like the whole editorial staff where the editor in chief was there and everyone. And I remember the decision being like, at least I was pushing like, we should just ignore this. Yes. And the reason I felt it was is because I, I was like, this is becoming a culture war. We got to focus on the products. Let's not even let's not even wade into having a narrative about any of this, whether it's right or wrong, women in gaming, minorities in gaming, all this journalism, ethics and journalism. It's this hodgepodge. I remember very clearly I turned 30 in 2014 and I went to Kentucky to do the bourbon trail for my birthday. And I met this guy at a dinner. And I, I, I vividly remember it because he was from some other, he's just from the outside world. And he and for one of the very rare times in my life, in my career, he's like, oh, so someone's asking me about video games that doesn't work in the industry. He's like, tell me about Gamergate. I heard something on PBS and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, honestly, I think it's about the inability of certain of an audience to opt in to a political experience. Yeah. And that I think is, is totally valid. I always tell our audience on sacred symbols, um, the creation of games is political and games are political, but they don't have to be. The story doesn't have to be certainly the creation, the workers rights and unions and all that stuff. All that goes into the creation of video games, the creation of capital and investment and all the rest, international economics. But the product themselves, when you have Mario, when we brought up earlier, or Zelda, another great product. This is an apolitical product that's not yeah. trying to say anything, not trying to do anything, not trying to offend anyone. And we should take it for what it is. And if there's a game like Gone Home, which is a famous game about um les a lesbian couple that that a lot of people got really upset about you should check it out it's really i think it's really great that game is deeply social and deeply political but it's an you opt in you know yeah. you kind of know what you're getting into so i think to me gamergate was this kind of tension of at least part of it was this tension of people saying listen i don't think everything needs to be like this i don't think we need to shoehorn progressivism and intersectionality and all of these viruses basically i don't think progressivism is necessarily vir virus but intersectionality certainly is i don't think we need to inject all of this into everything um why is that not okay and then that of course that played out in different ways game journalist you know affairs and uh payola and all of these different things but i actually think all of that was distractions like i always tell people i worked at the biggest website gaming's website in the world for years there was no payola there is no taking money from publishers there, none of that happened that might happen at smaller sites, but it didn't happen at ours. I can tell you that 100%. I don't even have a good relationship with them anymore, and I'm telling you that. Um, so I really think a lot of it, it was just people pushing back and saying, like, who has the power and who is going to kind of steer this massive industry that a lot of people, like, Michael, there's this joke people say all the time. When Fox, for instance, is covering games, they'll be like, did you know video games make more money than movies? It's like, this is the 23rd year that video games have made more money than movies. You know, like people don't know how to talk about them. They don't know what they're doing. We should try to take those things more seriously, but not everything has to be that. And I love that you brought up football because I'm a huge football and hockey fan. And I am so sick of the politicization of that shit too. Why are we even, why do we even have the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of one of these things? Nonetheless, like, can I just watch a football game? Can I just watch right. the Jets lose? Can I just watch the Islanders lose without having to have be beaten over the head with all these things? So I totally understand that. I think it's got to be an opt-in situation. And that's why with Sacred Symbols, you opt into listening to it, knowing you're going to get some economic and political takes in addition to your game's criticism and, and analysis. But you know that. I'm not trying to sneak it in. And I'm certainly not trying to indoctrinate you. And no <laughs> one who's a gamer, I would, or I wouldn't say no one, but I would think the vast majority of the game of gamers and people who cover gaming would have an issue if there is a black lesbian who's killing white nationalists and white supremacists and she's going through charlottesville and she would go go nuts make that game like yeah, who cares 
Like I don't if, care. If, if the game's a great game, go enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like if you're playing, you know, Axis and Allies or whatever, something like that, you're not thinking this validates the Axis or validates the Allies. It's a game. Right. It, it, that's exactly right. It, and you see this. You brought up, well, we brought up Kingdom Come Deliverance before, and, and you saw that with Six Days in Fallujah. Um, which was a game about Iraq that was supposed to come out in 2009 and was basically finished and canceled and never published. So they ate tens of millions of dollars on this, the publisher Konami. And that game has been remade and is coming out next year. And you can oh. already see this bubbling of, they don't even know what the fuck, the, I mean, we know what the game is about, the second battle of Fallujah, but they don't know what it is. And they're already right. mad. You know, they're already upset. Do you kill brown people? You know, is, is this too close to Iraq to tell a story? Is it going to cause PTSD and all these kinds of things? I'm like, guys, it's a game. Yeah. What's the difference between a game and a book and a movie and a, and a TV show? I don't understand that either. So I'm I'm maximal about that stuff, too. And um, I, I, I'm sorry. Under, go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say, I have no problems with storefronts like PlayStation Network, Xbox, all those saying, like, we're not selling this like X, Y or Z because like there's a game called like, a really notorious game you might have heard of from a long time ago called Ray Play, which was basically this like pc game that was a rape simulator i think i never played it obviously and it wasn't sold anywhere you had to go i think somewhere to get it i think that's within well within the rights of platform holders to say we don't sure. want to sell this shit but as far as the creation of things i just i'd rather be maximal in that a uh, maximalist in that and just say it's all fiction you know and i can't imagine but that uh for many people including vets playing video games is a great way to deal with depression and or anxiety and blow off some steam and kind of there's a gr there's a great organization called the reverend warriors you know and they deal with like suicidal ideation among vets by using like memes and dark humor and it's like whatever tool works for you to help you with your mental health now obviously you know i'm sure you agree video games can have a deleterious effect on mental health and it causes some people to be antisocial and it's an excuse not to leave the house and meet people and that's fine and that is an issue but for lots of people, it's like, I had a rough day at work. You know, maybe my dad's a jerk. Maybe my teacher, my boss. I'm going to sit around and I'm going to go, you know, kill some mushrooms. And it's 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 fine. And it frankly, a lot of that stuff has a better story and better visuals than most of the TV shows out there. Yeah, absolutely. I, to me, I'm so glad you said that. The Last of Us on HBO right now is a really great crossover event in which people are seeing what video games can do. Um, and like what stories video games can tell and the experiences you can have there. And we have a lot of, you know, soldiers and Marines and whatever in our, in our audience. And you hear from them, video games are a huge part of their lives when yeah. they're overseas, yeah. you know, um, and more Xbox than PlayStation to be perfectly honest. But you, I hear stories. I have a bunch of buddies that were in the Marines and all these different things. They'd play call of duty in their tents in Afghanistan, you know, using satellite internet, downloading things when they go to bases and trying to, like, they loved it. And I think that, it's kind of um, it's kind of presumptuous to tell people that they can't handle a certain thing and that it's, you know, being, being offended on their behalf. That's a big problem. And so, uh, yeah, but it, it, going back to Gamergate, that I, I don't know, Michael, if you agree, but I feel like that is. I think that that's the most key analysis is it's simply about opting in and opting out and asking yourself, when did it become like this? You know, when did it become like everyone always talks about Walter? Remember the Walter Cronkite era and all of this kind of stuff? And I'm like, yeah, I guess. But that was different. They talk about trust and institutions and all these kinds of things. And I'm like, why can't we just worry about that in the spaces they belong? And if you have something political to say about a video game, it should be a political video game or about the creation of it. You don't put politics in things where they don't belong. You don't get to interpret things and assume it's right. You know, um, all the stuff that's going on with Hogwarts Legacy right now and, and trans oh, and God. J.K. Rowling and all that. It's a fucking nightmare. And it sucks. And that game is selling. That game is the second best selling game on Steam right now. And it's not even out because people are so upset about being pushed around about it that they're just going and buying it. And uh, yeah. that's what happened to that game. Kingdom Come Deliverance too. that game sold a couple million copies. And that studio ended up being purchased by Embracer Group. The guys that made it all made millions of dollars and they won. Wait, so you know? in that game where, again, it's the Middle Ages and mm -hmm. the complaint was there aren't enough African-Americans, mm -hmm. did they bend the knee or do no. they stick okay so they're like yeah we're not putting black people in a game about 14th century europe no because there was a piece i think on polygon or something where which is a horrible website but they were saying you know like well there's a there's like a journal of a traveling middle eastern sale you know like i want to say salesman a middle eastern tra uh, trader that was in this area around this time I'm like guys what are you saying that they this person in bohemia might have seen a black person once 
And so the person should be in the game. I just don't understand. And and it just seems, you know, what's a really interesting um, example. But also, can I say one more thing? Yeah, please, please. I also love the idea that if there's going to be black people in this era, that everyone else isn't going to be racist toward them. <laughs> exactly. Right? They'd be treated horribly, probably. They would be, they would be like, they would be treated, they'd be enslaved. Is that what right. you, I, mean, I don't think that's better. No, I don't think so either. And uh, I was going to say, you know, it's a very Western and even, a, I always say America exports this nonsense to the rest yes, of the world yes. and it sucks japan so there's a game on playstation came out in 2020 i don't know if you've heard of it called ghost of tsushima it's no, a game that takes place on tsushima island in japan about a thousand years ago it's a wonderful third person action adventure game and it's made by a studio in washington called sucker punch mostly white guys and this game was so well respected it's 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 a representation of japanese culture of japanese history is so well represented that there's basically like a ghost of tsushima day in that on that place paying homage to the american creators of the game saying like you did a wonderful job with this product you did a wonderful job you would never see that out of out of the united states saying like right. you know oh bravo you would always try to throw it to the intersectionality and just destroy or ruin it and i feel so bad we have such a I know how much you love America and I do, too. And we have such a wonderful culture and such wonderful people. And it's like, this is what we're known for now. And it's really a shame. You know, um, we used to be known for like liberty. <laughs> yeah. And things but like I, I that. mean, I think that this goes back further. You know, this goes back to Woodrow Wilson and this kind of Pax Americana and this idea that we're going to put American values everywhere. It's just what the nature of those American values were have changed but they have been we have ex historically not been exporting conservative or right of center values we have historically been exporting leftist values the conservatives don't like hearing that but it, it's kind of is the case and what those leftist values of the moment are in my view have changed a lot you know in the last 40 years but the the conveyor belt uh is is you know very similar the yeah, process. Blatant, blatantly changed i mean yeah. I, to the point where like my dad i grew up on long island Pretty oh, conservative, gosh. but 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 paleo conservative, you know, yeah, like yeah. Rockefeller conservatives. My dad was a Republican and is a Republican. My wait a mom. minute, Rockefeller was the opponent of the conservatives. Rockefeller Republicans are the like more middle, what would be called rhinos today, socially liberal. They were called rhinos then. They he was booed at the 1964 convention. No, I know. I'm saying that's okay. us though. That's our. Okay. That is, yeah, yeah. That, okay. Yeah, yeah. We we are. We would consider ourselves like I don't want to say log cabin Republicans because I don't really like that term. Or I guess what people. The Do you know who Cabin Republicans are? Aren't they like the 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 Rhino Republicans? No, the, they're the gay Republicans. The modern I thought the Lock Cabin Republican was like an old 19th century term. I think it no, no, there's an organization for the last 20 years where the Lock Cabin Republicans are oh. the gay Republicans. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, they are modern. Shout out to them. Uh, <laughs> but we we grew up so actually, um, what the what's the guy's name that ran for uh why can't I think of it? Lee Zeldin was our yeah. congressman in my Got district. it, okay. Not so we're not in Santos's district in Nassau County, where the guy that lied about everything. So I grew up in a pretty mixed yeah. environment that was very moderate. You know, um, you know, you had like George Pataki and Rudy oh, Giuliani yeah. and all these things, but you also had Chuck Schumer and Hillary Clinton came and carpet bagged. And so I had a very moderate experience growing up. Yeah. And I thought it was pretty, pretty righteous, you know, like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I was very inspired by the Berkeley era leftists in a lot of ways growing up and kind of as a kind of feeling more of a more like a conservative in a lot of ways was almost jealous that the other side had such a stranglehold on populism and such a stranglehold on speech and all these things. Yeah. And they let it go. And now all of their advantages are gone and leaving almost nothing interesting for me. Um, and I, I think it's a shame that it, you're talking about Woodrow Wilson. I was thinking a lot about, God, that 1912 election, man. Like how consequential. We talk about Long Island, Teddy Roosevelt. You know, we wouldn't have never even had Woodrow Wilson if that if that nonsense didn't happen um, with Taft and Roosevelt. And then we have all everything that comes from that entry into World War One. And of course, this this first idea of the of what would become the UN and all these different things. So it's so funny you bring him up just because I've been thinking about him a lot lately. Um, yeah, he, he's the big villain in American history by far. Um, and as I point out in my new book, The White Pill, he campaigned on, he kept us out of war in 1916. And a few months later, trying to keep Americans from getting drafted was a felony. 
Um, and Eugene V. Debs, who's the socialist candidate, went to jail and stayed in jail even after the World War I was over. And he had to be either pardoned or commuted, I don't remember which, by Warren Harding. But to advocate against the draft to send Americans to fight a war in Europe between a Kaiser, a Shah, a king, and an emperor, somehow like you were the bad guy, you're un American. It, it's, it's so deranged and like it really is the big boss battle of all american history like this is where the pure evil comes in and and roosevelt opened the door for him he, yeah he it was sucks first, yeah it sucks i just because teddy's like my favorite and not only is he long island's own but he's kind of the he's kind of the the there's a lot of, about him that i don't ag agree with like the, kind of the more bravado uh foreign policy and all that kind of stuff spanish american war all that it's a little little weird but i love the proud america i love the story about when when um mckinley's assassinated and they have to go basically find him like he's in wyoming somewhere in the woods and like they have to go tell him like you're the president you need to get back to washington they have no idea where he is like just so, what a wonderful character and yeah to just be kind of come be, become this um this ringer almost that gave us wilson obviously he didn't know <laughs> what was going to become of that but I, I it's so funny you brought that up because i was just i was thinking a lot about that lately and 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 that that election it didn't have to go that way so it's oh, very yeah. consequential yeah yeah uh, um just a chap is no is no angel either. So these are the three really just awful, awful choices, which uh, is something that's not uncommon uh, in, in contemporary politics. Hey, Colin, I know you gamers like collecting gold coins, so I want to take a second to talk to you about Patriot Gold. Now, BlackRock has warned to prepare for recession unlike any other, and history has proven the only way the Fed can fight inflation is with a recession, and everyone's news resolution is to buy gold and silver. Over 80% of retirees are concerned about inflation and very concerned about the stock market. In 2008, the stock market and housing market crashed. Meanwhile, gold went from 800 an ounce to 1600 an ounce over the next two and a half years. So big banks and billionaires are agreeing on two things. One, we're heading toward a recession. Food prices are going through the roof. Eggs are a problem. Energy bills are skyrocketing. And investors need to buy gold, which several analysts are predicting will hit all-time highs. It's the only capital that's going to be worth something if you know what hits the fan. What else can you invest in that will hold its value? Patriot Gold Group is introducing their 2023 Recession Protection No Fee for Life IRA. Call the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. You don't want to be that person looking at your 401k, crying. You'll get best-in-class service from Patriots protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA 401k can be in physical gold or silver, and you may be eligible for No Fee for Life IRA on qualifying rollovers. All you got to do is call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide, or and mention my name, Michael Malice, or just go to malicegold.com. It's easy. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer six years in a row, so call 888-505-9845 and mention my name, or just go to malicegold.com. And let's get back to Colin. Let's let's talk about something a little more fun. Let's talk about gaming. Okay. okay? Uh, and I, 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 this is going to be kind of a tough question, but I'm sure off the top of your head, you give me two or three good answers. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the best games for someone sitting at home to just sit and watch a walkthrough? Because for me, watching a, like a no commentary walkthrough is for some of these video games is like watching something that's better than literally 99% of movies that are out there. Um, I agree. Yeah, and uh, I like that you like the commentary list ones too, because I do too. I, I don't like Let's Plays too much. I don't need the commentary yeah. and all of that. There's a great, do you know the, the YouTube channel World of Let, uh, I think it's called World of Long Plays. Yes. You might like, yeah, yeah, I love that. That, that yeah. a lot, watch a lot of old stuff on there. I, and also MK Fire and Ice, I think is the other one I watch. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one too. Um, Well, I know you like, you're an Ayn Rand fan like me. Oh, okay. and, uh, the, what's that, Bioshock? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I was wondering if you like Bioshock or Bioshock Infinite. Okay, can we can we okay, let's go full Aspie here. Okay. Okay. Sure. This those by Bi that Bioshock game really triggered me. Okay. Because the premise of Bioshock is you had this kind of Ayn Randian civilization and then it kind of imploded and now they're like underwater or they were underwater the whole time, and you have to fight your way through it and fight the big bad guy and whatever, right? And you have all these these uh like amalgams of or amalgam i never how it's pronounced between human and robot and they're there you have to fight them and these little kid demons were everywhere so on and so forth the ecology of this universe drives me crazy because what are all these entities eating if everything because there's there's some people who are still there i'm like what are they doing like I, there's no food there's no opportunity to create food how are they living there so that really takes me out of the game yeah i think that might be explained with like the most of them are so-called spliced, you know, at that point. So there might be something to, like where they're taking their, those drugs that they're all addicted to. 
which might have something to do with it. I don't know this because in well, I don't want to spoil it. I, I just think that that's a fun one for people to, to watch. And I, I think a, a recent one, well, not more, not too recent, but I, I just replayed Uncharted 4. And all of the Uncharted games are wonderful. And those are about they're like Indiana Jones, basically. Uh, you go around the world. You got your your character, Nathan Drake. He's got his companion, Sully, who's kind of this older mentor figure. And they go around the world and they adventure and they find hidden relics and get in dangers. And that's a really wonderful, high budget, high fidelity series. And we brought up The Last of Us as well. I think that that's another one that is just awesome. And I would really love people to watch a, a, a Let's Play of the first game and compare it and contrast it to what's going on on HBO because there are a lot of differences between the two as well, although they're written by the same person. So, um, so yeah, I, I, those are three off the top of my head. If people like more, like there are fun um, puzzle games that I, I think can get really immersed in, like Fez and stuff like that, that I think are really entertaining to watch. But I think you and I are simpatico in that if you want a story uh, and you want kind of character, Uncharted is a good place to go. Um, the last of us is a good place to go playstation is a great place to be i mean that's what they that's what they're known for is character driven games so another one is uh that i really like and I'm, i would bet a lot of money that you like it as well as control i think it's called loved it loved it yeah, yeah. wonderful and that sequel comes out maybe this year um, oh really yeah, yeah so okay this is really it's really fun talking to people who have your job because you're gonna have a lot of opinions and it's just so fun to watch you spurg out a little bit um <laughs> what's your thoughts on cuphead cuphead it's beautiful um, really hard, really, really hard. It's actually one of the few games that I think I could sit there. I have an old school bonafides like you do 2d hard yeah. action, NES, <laughs> SNES era. This game is so above and beyond that, in my opinion. And it's one of the few games where I'm like, I don't think I can do this. Like, I don't think I, I, I think I would bash my head into a wall if I sat here and learned this game enough. And so what I ended up doing is actually, I, I beat the first two or three, I think two worlds, I think there are four. And then I actually went on YouTube and just watched the rest because I wanted to see what the bosses were and stuff like that. And I'm like, I'm actually starting to, from my personal opinion, I'm like, I'm starting to hate this because it's it's beating the shit out of me, but it's so beautiful. I just want to watch it. Yeah. And so, but that's a wonderful game. And that that um expansion just came out a couple months ago, I think. Yeah, yeah. Delicious the, last course. The, the, yeah. yeah, the DLC. Yeah. Um, it, it's, for those who don't know, Cuphead is done in this 1920s, like rubber hose animation style. Um, it's absolutely, it's like a cartoon. Every level, almost few exceptions, is a boss fight. Uh, the bosses change form throughout the level. Um, it's just like, it's just like takes you back to being a kid. But I've never even tried to play it because everyone I've talked to goes, you don't understand how hard it is. And when they're watching the playthroughs and the guys are just like crushing it, they're just sitting with my friends. They're like, I don't know how they're doing this because this level took me literally like 90 minutes to beat and he's doing it in 10 minutes. It's crazy. It's it is take it from me crazy hard. And yeah, people people there are some savants out there, dude. Like that are just so. Actually, we have one of them on my on my show, Chris Raygun. He's just so good at games, like naturally. And I remember sitting down with him. Mega Man is my favorite series. Oh yeah, and and the NES games. And those are pretty hard games, but I'm really good at them, proficient at them. We we play them. So we actually did a let's play a few years ago where I was going to be like, let's sit down and play this and see how you do and make fun of you and stuff. And he just was fine. And I was like, Jesus Christ, you never even played this. This would this took us a lot of study to get through at that time. But yeah, your your audience should check out Cuphead. What a beautiful, yeah. absolutely stunning game. And a great example of where games I don't think people understand what games are today. And I feel like Cuphead is a really nice interstitial. They yeah. this game this game is in the same plane as Mario. It just looks better. If you can understand that games look like better than they used to, now you can understand the difference in plane and the difference in in perspective. And um so Cuphead's actually a great leaping point i think for people what you should do with chris is do what i have in my house and get him some of those old gaming watches and then watch him try to be don kong jr <laughs> like yeah, and yeah. do that loop for like days at a time yeah flip the score or something like that um, <laughs> yeah yeah he's he's a savant he's crazy at, at, at the games i'm jealous but let's talk let's go back to what we were talking about earlier so is my thesis correct in terms of i am not denying that there is clearly a very organized movement in the gaming community as there is in virtually every other community to try to push a certain ideology through is that ideology as prevalent and as powerful in 2023 as it was in 2017 i don't think it is like i i think in some sense it's funny because i almost got canceled at like the worst possible time that was a pretty bad time remember that i think it was like the year before that 
woman went to Africa made like the age it's joke. Justine Sacco, wasn't right? Right, Justine Sacco, right. Yeah. I feel like that was kind of the impetus of this, yes. that era, in my opinion. And so, but for those who don't know, let's give the background. She sure. was working, she was she's a lawyer or something, a PR person. I don't remember who it was. She's like about to bo board my flight to Africa. Hope I don't get AIDS. JK, I'm white, right? That right. was her right. Which, is, which, which clearly uh, offensive humor. And that's, but, but the thing is, as her flight is proceeding, she doesn't have her phone, her life's being destroyed. And I think she's still like in hiding. I don't think she's ever recovered. Yeah, that's, that's horrible. I mean, it's, it's a really ill, it's like an off color joke. I personally think it's pretty funny. Uh, but it's way better than my joke. Yeah. But, um, and also way more offensive as well than my joke. But yeah, I always think of her when I'm like, yeah, that was kind of the, maybe the beginning of this movement, but I think things have tamped down. I think maybe you think people were just shocked that a woman was actually funny. You think that that was what <laughs> I often am when I see that, um, <laughs> this is the one, all, time. the yeah. one time <laughs> they're not all, what's that woman? Uh, G Gadsby. I, well, I actually Hannah watched Gatsby. That, Hannah Gatsby. I actually watched earnestly watched that. And I was like, Jesus Christ, um, this is rough. But uh, yeah, I think what ended up happening, there's an important thing, Michael, that happened in the games industry, which is the and it actually maybe even started with Gamergate and took a long time to play out. But the media is irrelevant in video okay. games right now. Totally irrelevant. And the, the power players in games now are on YouTube, podcasts, Twitch and, you know, etc. None of the websites have any gravitas. None of them are able to hold their talent. I think when we left to found kind of funny almost 10 years ago now, I think a lot of people that had numbers and had a name for themselves saw the writing on the walls like we should also do this. So there are no name. It's kind of a dead end. And the musical chairs is becoming urgent at this point as people get laid off. There's just not a lot of positions anymore. So I unfortunately for them, although th these are a lot of people that celebrated my downfall so they can go fuck themselves. But yeah, um, I think that the sa sanity is slowly being reinjected into video games as the power structure in media um it diminishes and i know you talk a lot in the political realm about how much the media hates you and yeah. and not you the royal you yeah, yeah. and that's very much true in video games as well they don't like you they're they have a adversarial relationship they don't like games i don't think they even want to be in video games a lot of them i think this is kind of where they, yeah, they want up. to work for the new york times that's exactly right and so they try to inject their politics into everything they can, but slowly people are like, we're just not listening. You don't have the numbers. Websites are shutting down. Staffs but, are truncating. But also, how many different ways can you tell me that this video game is sexist? That's exactly like when right. When people play Super Mario 2, you're perfectly happy to do Princess Toadstool because she could float. No one's sitting at home like, I'm not going to play a girl. It's just, it's all nonsense. I think it, it traces, I always talk about Star Wars even. Like Princess Leia was an empowered, people, it's like Princess Leia was an empowered you know, leader she of killed Jabba, not Luke. Spoiler. Right, exactly. Exactly. And even Mon Mothma and all these other things. And then of course in video games that we were just talking about the last of us, the, the, it's about a really badass girl and no one gives a shit. Like that's a totally manufactured thing. I don't think anyone even cares right. that no one's ever cared about that in my experience, but you, you touched on something so vital, which is they're all the same. Yeah. And that was one thing I was, I, I'm still friendly with some people at IGN and, and the founder of IGN pair Schneider, I remember asking him, why didn't you ever replace me? Like literally replace me because I was writing from a conservative angle. I was writing op-eds and editorials. And that was what was so unusual was no one gave a shit during that era. Obama was in office. No one cared. What was I was saying? I had a huge Ron Paul placard at my desk at IGN in San Francisco. No one gave a shit. So I really feel like the, the degradation of mainstream media which I'm really hoping and pulling for just happens everywhere because I hate the media everywhere. Um, that I think has really allowed normal voices to at least start to make themselves known and make that in balance a little more balanced. At least the power still with the media and PR, especially in the publishers who push these ideologies, but people are not vibing with it anymore as much as they were, if they ever were. And it's like I said, with, um, with Hogwarts legacy, if you read, so-called trans Twitter or the or progressive Twitter, whatever the case might be, you think that this was the the game was going to bomb and it, no one cared and J.K. Rowling's evil. And yet I think this game's on the fast track to 10 million sold easily. And that's last laugh kind of shit for um, people like J.K. Rowling and a real punch in the face to the ideologues that try to kind of, again, shove their politics and their ideologies into all things. And so I really feel I'm oh, sorry. sorry go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so I really feel like for. The culture war is many fronts. 
Yeah. And in our front in the game space, which I'm I'm a, I'm a happy culture warrior. Uh, I'm willing to fight the culture war on my front. I feel like things are changing a great deal. You know, Last Stand is the biggest video game podcast network, fan funded podcast network in the history of Patreon. It's not even close. And we're the only ones that sound different than a lot of the other people. So there's something to be said about that. And I don't even think I always say I don't even think I'm like I think I'm good at this. I think I'm I think I'm good at video games. I know video games and all that, but I don't think I'm the extraordinary talent. I just think that I sound a little different and say different things. It's so easy to just not be like everyone else. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that you can you've encountered many, many people whose knowledge of video games who are literally on the spectrum. I'm not saying this derisively at all, mm -hmm. whose knowledge of video games is so encyclopedic that you could just sit there and you'd be like, holy crap, this dude blows me out of the water. So I absolutely. Mean, yeah. But this also something to piggyback to what you just said as well is, you know, I, I think people who are thinking in these terms don't know how to take a win. Because they're going to hear about the the L's left, uh, you know, all over the map. But when there's a win, like the people who suffer the L don't mention that it's an L for them, so you don't really realize it's a win. When the Joker movie was coming out, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's as amazing as ever, I think it's a very good movie. People think it's the best movie of all time. I just, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's not as good as everyone says. That's it. I'm still saying it's very good. They were starting to have a press tour, and the press tour was trying to make it out. This is alt right. This is going to cause school violence. This is in, this is promoting incels, you know, blowing up the school. And they're, you know, you know what? We're pulling the interviews. We're not talking to any of you guys, right? And it was like, oh, this movie's going to fail. They're not talking to journalists. Like, good luck breaking your movie out when you're not talking to us. And the movie, like, was beyond record-breaking. And now there's a sequel with Lady Gaga. And no one kind of talks about the fact that this movie, which is political, has political points to it, but it certainly mm -hmm. doesn't port easily to Republican or Democrat, conservative or liberal. I mean, the issues are nuanced and you know very thought provoking. And he's obviously not a good guy, to put it mildly. Um, the fact that they said you are not going to be reporting on this movie fairly. You have your stories written already which are just making trying to make us out look to be something like we're not. No one's saying that the Joker is a role model and you should be slicing people's throats open. And to imply that is so outrageous as to be despicable. You want to write those articles? Go write them. We're not going to talk to you. And that's a good example of, uh, or of a uh, piece of work where they're like, you know what? We've shown we don't need them. And if we talk to them and, uh, and, and associate with them and interact with them, it's only going to be to our detriment. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. It's amazing watching people just on YouTube and in podcast space and on Twitch just running circles around yeah. people with production outfits and all of this. I always make fun of IGN now or the people there because I'm like, imagine being given a place like when I left IGN in 2014, it was the biggest gaming website in the world. It was doing great. There were a lot of great people there. Imagine being bestowed that and fucking it up. You know, like totally screwing it up. And then it's your fault that you did it. You can blame inexorable trends and all these things, but it's the individuals at these various outlets that ultimately led to the downfall. The Joker stuff, the, the ironic thing about it is that they're going to write those stories with Joaquin Phoenix's quote or not. And Joaquin Phoenix's talking to them is only giving it maybe some credence even. Yes. So I think that they made the right choice. And I've long told in consulting in the games industry and just talking to friends who make games. And we, I, I co-own a game studio too, so we deal with this as well. Is I don't think you, I don't think you gain anything from talking to the press. And in fact, having an adversarial relationship with them, I think, actually would benefit you. Like if I were doing a PR plan for a video game today, I would be like, how can we make it so that we look like we have a bad relationship with Kotaku, that we have a bad relationship with Polygon, that we have that take the piss out of these guys because it actually makes us look better. Um, it's sad that, that that's happened because I remember being in the press when we weren't the villain, or at least I wasn't, I wasn't looking at it that way. And now I look at these people and they are hanging on for dear life, man. I mean, it's, it's over. I mean, it, it well, is over. Can so, you speak more on that? Like to, to how far have they fallen and by what metric are you saying they're over? So some websites have just folded like, uh, okay. fan bite went away a long time ago. One up went away. I mean, that was kind of the harbinger of things to come. But all of the websites, traffic. Wait, can I interrupt you? Like, why did they go away? Is that the ad revenue? Like, what was wrong with their model that they had to fold? Well, I th so this all goes back to personalities, right? Okay. And if you, there are two ways to pioneer with video game websites. You either have a, a location that people go to, which is not really what, how people use the internet anymore. People used to go to IGN all the time and just look at what's there. 
Um, so if you don't have that, then you have two other ways to get people is either your personalities, which IGN doesn't have anymore, for instance, or you do SEO, you know, scraping on Google, which is a really profitable thing if you can do it properly. But when websites go all in on SEO scraping, then it leaves no place for their personalities. They can't pay for them. There's no reason for them to be there, but you can't have um, the success on SEO without having a, a ton of say strategy guide content and all these things, this churn. So I actually think it was kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy that you put all these people into the lowest common denominator SEO uh, stuff because you don't have the draw anymore because these people have left and that just doesn't materialize because now everyone's in that boat. Now they're all competing with each other. So you can just see if you've been in games for a long time and I'm sure your listeners who who have have been in the in the sphere for a long time will know like none of the who even works at these websites anymore? Who reads them? Do you go? I'm not saying you, but the royal you. Do you go yeah. to Kotaku anymore? Do you go to IGN anymore? Or do you get your news on Twitter? Or do you go to YouTube? It's just demonstrably obvious. And you can see on Graftreon just the growth of a lot of video game Patreons as the websites, you know, if you go on Alexa and these other places that they, they that they diminish. And it's becoming more desperate, I think, in some way as well. So it's, I mean, it, it is over. I, mean, I, I, I give it a few more years. The big ones like IGN and GameSpot will survive because they are so entrenched in web 1.0. They've just been around forever. They're just yep. everywhere. But websites like Polygon, Kotaku, these things, they're, they're done. I mean, it's it's a really just a matter of time. And I would like to talk to everyone out there who is around me and Colin's age who think, oh, this is going to be the same perpetuity. Remember Coconuts? Remember Sam Goody? Remember The Wiz? Uh, those aren't going anywhere. And then now half the audience is like, what the hell are you guys talking about? So and Tower Tower Records like right. that was the mainstay of of the Broadway and on in Manhattan. Nobody and beats now, the Wiz was our shit on on Long Island. Yeah. Um and uh yeah so it's and in our space it was the magazines like the the yeah. websites put the magazines out of business. I was part of the movement of the websites that were was there as websites rose and magazines fell. Now the websites are in the magazine situation and who knows what will happen from there. But I think I think the 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 democratization the small D democratization of tools yeah. to allow people to communicate has done a wonder for truth and reality and all these different things and, and the versatility of people's abilities to do different things in their lives. I think it's awesome. And so I, I personally, and I, I, it's not that I want individuals to get laid off, but I take great glee at the, at the fall of these websites, especially oh, because, because they were so against me personally. It's, I take that, I'm not going to sit here and act it out in person, but I'm paying attention and I know, and I laugh on my own that when hey, people, Colin, yeah, they can learn to code. Yeah, ex exactly. Exactly. Uh, I got to tell you, like as someone who's like not really, I wouldn't definitely not call myself a gamer, but I'm a huge fan of the gaming subculture because it is to me such, and this is increasing, I think exponentially, and I'm sure you could speak on this, such an opportunity for young creative people who, if they have a lot of spare time and they have a lot of drive and a lot of creativity can bring a product to market and very quickly through word of mouth, find an audience. So the cost benefit metrics are really incentivizing the best possible things. And everyone I know who is in the gaming space, even peripherally is so excited and enthusiastic year after year about how things are progressing in this subculture uh, and the product that's coming out as opposed to, let's suppose comic books, where DC Comics is telling like literally the exact same story every five years about zero hour Christ on infinite earths. They just, it's like a blender. Whereas with games, it's like there's so much innovation and so much new space. And it's just, there's something for everyone. It to me, and I know it's it's uh, a lot of people would disagree, but I, I think it's the superior version form of entertainment because it can be so many different things. It can be sitting down and turning your brain off, or it could be really, really oh, engaging, yeah. you know, and not only with story, you brought up Axis and Allies, which is a great board game, and there's a digital version of it, of course, but there are deep, like ungodly games like EVE Online. I don't know if you've heard of that game and others mm -hmm. that are just EVE Online is you are a it's an MMO where you are a, a, a captain of a spaceship and it is you got to look into it, Michael. It is so nerdy and deep. They re literally release economic um, reports from their universe in book form every quarter and people buy them. I love and that. it's like this very serious thing that it's run out of Iceland. And so I love the idea that it, it can be really whatever you want it to be. I'm a voracious yeah. reader. I love watching TV shows when I can. I'm a, I'm a musician, but but video games are everything, man. And, and if, if I had to choose one one entertainment medium, it would definitely be video games because it can be so many things. And, and, and one of my life's pursuits is trying to open people's minds to, the, to games. 
both in my family and outside um, to what it can be. Th this this idea of it can be anything you want it to be. And it's becoming so immersive in VR and the controllers and the analog sticks and the rumble and the online play and all this. There's so many great things, so many different ways to pay and play and all that. So games are a very exciting place. I think it's so vibrant and people should get in, in, involved and it's so easy to do. You can do it almost on any platform. And I'll give the lefties a bone in that it is a good thing that more girls are playing video games. And it I is agree. a good thing that it's like, it's becoming more, I don't want to say acceptable, but there, there's, the, the the variety of different games for different types of people is just increasing all the time and there's something for everyone and it's a lot of fun. The, the, you know, just this also speaks to, I'm going to trigger you a little bit because this is something that triggers me because I know this is going to drive you crazy. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, which was like the OG mm -hmm. role-playing game, you know, it's, it's there's video game versions, but it's nothing beats that, you know, the, 20 sided dice. I still have my dice from when I was a kid upstairs in the box. I, I had it in since 1985. Um, and it got bought out by Wizards of the Coast, which was mm -hmm. the guys behind Magic the Gathering. And they recently sat down in the wake of uh, Black Lives Matter. And within this video game, which is, or excuse me, board game, uh, not board game, role playing game. Sorry. Yeah, tabletop uh, role playing game. Tabletop yeah. role playing game, which is very much based on Lord of the Rings, which I didn't realize as a kid because I heard of Dungeon Dragons first, and then I'm like, oh, Tolkien ripped off Dungeon Dragons. Like when you hear a cover song first, do you think the original is the cover? Right. So you have the hobbits. Yeah, sorry, the halflings. Mm -hmm. You have the humans. You have the elves. You have the dwarves. Gnomes are a lesser used race. Then you have the the, co the the goblins, and you have the kobolds, uh, and you had the orcs, and they just recently sat down and decided. Oh, the orcs are, are 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 a metaphor for like black people, and we have to get rid of them. And I have known dozens, and I have read all the books when I was in high school the, uh, that 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 TSR put out. I have never, met, and I was at Charlottesville. I have <laughs> never met anyone who even joked that the the different races of beings in Dungeons Dragons in any way was a metaphor or an analogy for the different races of human beings. No, uh, in fact, doesn't that say something about you? It's so if crazy. If you see that in, in it, because I, I totally agree with you. I, I used to be, I think it was totally dispelled, but I loved the idea that it was a metaphor for World War II or something like that. And, oh, I, and okay. that, wasn't, that wasn't intended, like the Eagles come in late and like they okay. save the day and all that you know, kind of shit. But I don't think any of that's true. I think Tolkien and his son have spoken about that. But I, I look at that. It's the same thing with J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter. I think the the bankers or something are supposed to be some sort. Like people look at that and are like, is, "This is a Jewish." It's us. It's so, us. Yeah, and I'm like, Shh, I'm gonna have to <laughs> shut down this podcast. <laughs> and I'm like, I think that that might say something about you if that's what you see here. I mean, that's right. my my personal take. So I I find it weird. And dude, TSR. D and D specifically, AD and D version two was my shit. I loved it. So from the one that came out in the early '90s and. It was so different back then than it is now. They they release new editions constantly. Wizards of the Coast is owned by Hasbro now, so it's now it's within this okay. toy company. It's all fucked up. But and there was a whole controversy about them trying to monetize other people's content and all this stuff. But that's the beginning. It's true. D and D is the embryonic state of the video game role playing game. Yeah, right on down to stats and the and the you know I always tell people this when you play Madden, you're do it's a bunch of dice rolls in the background. That's what it is. It's a role playing game, and like you you collide with the defensive lineman it's doing dice rolls based on your statistics to see like how what happens who collides you fall do you fumble so it all begins with that very quaint game and i love it and i i, I love to see that people still play it and that it's like still as popular as ever because it's a great way to use one's imagination but it's even more triggering because there actually is a race of black beings in this game called the dark elves and they live underground and they're matriarchal but like if you're going to try to make this metaphor work or this racism work you're it, you're gonna need an intelligence of 19 because the regular human mind that's a joke for all you D, &D people yes, yes 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 yes. the regular human mind can't get there because the gymnast but but i think that's the other po point of this is gamers by their nature are there to solve puzzles right i want to get to the end of the board the monsters are there the obstacles are there to prevent them from getting the end board which have been placed by the developer and i have to figure out how to kind of work their way around it but when they're trying to just put in these obstacles at a certain point, it's like, why am I playing this? This game sucks. And that is why I think in your industry, they are losing so hard. Because at a certain point, people just throw down the controller like you do with Cuphead. And you're like, I can't win this. And it's not fun anymore. I hate it. Right. That's exactly right. That's a great point. You have to wonder at Wizards of the Coast, for instance, 
who was it that even discovered that or figured out in quotes that this was an issue just with right. the orcs for instance like where does that come from i know it's like dei and all this stuff but it's just weird to me it's seeking problems where there are none and actually creating a lot of division and hostility for no particular reason um i'm not i, I used to think we were kind of post-racial i don't know that i really feel that way anymore but i think a lot of that comes from the fact that people just choose to divide and subdivide over and over again instead of just being like the, i personally believe in the goodness of most people and, and i don't i don't think that most people are racist i don't think most people intend ill will i don't think most people care that you're gay i don't think most people care that you're trans i don't think i just think people are kind of more tired of being told things yes you know i think it's just that simple colin we're running out of time what has been your favorite part of this interview i honestly talking to you man i'm a big fan i i, I think you're you're First of all, your show has a bunch of diverse and interesting people on it. I was recently turned on um, because of you and a few others for, to um, that guy, Curtis Yarbin, who I, I never. Oh, yeah. And he's just it's so interesting to listen to people like you and others um, talk about deep ideas that are so different than the mainstream. And I think so speaking to you is a great reminder of what happens in the independent space and how um, and how people can thrive and have real conversations that are so above and beyond what's going on on the mainstream. So. The, not to blow smoke up your ass, but you know, I followed you for a long time and it's been a really great pleasure to talk to you and be on your show because, and I take that as a great honor and I'm sure a lot of your audience is like, who the fuck is this? Um, but it's been, it's been really fun just talking to you, talking to someone really smart and canny. So I appreciate that. You are welcome. All month long on Pluto TV, stream the biggest Tyler Perry movies free. Watch your favorites like Medea's Witness Protection and Medea's Big Happy Family. Join Tyler Perry as he goes on a couples retreat with Sharon Leal in Why Did I Get Married? Or Idris Elba and Gabrielle Union in the Tyler Perry directed film Daddy's Little Girls. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies and TV shows available on live and on demand. Download the free Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now. Pluto TV. Drop in, watch free.